A desert can be green for a while. The real trick is keeping it green after the first harvest. Egypt is betting billions that it can. West of the Nile, excavators are carving a 114-kilometer artificial river through the sand, while the world's largest agricultural drainage treatment plant hums on the Mediterranean coast, gulping up millions of cubic meters of murky water and spitting out irrigation. The promise is seductive. Take a sliver of the Sahara, add Nile water, recycled runoff, a dash of ancient groundwater, and conjure wheat potatoes, and olives out of dunes. The question is not whether you can make crops grow in a desert. People do that all over the Middle East. The question is whether you can do it at the scale Egypt is attempting without burning through your water, salting your soils, and bankrupting the grid. Here's the pitch. Egypt's population keeps rising while usable farmland stays mostly the same. Threaded along a thin green ribbon by the Nile and fanning into the delta, so the state launched the New Delta Project, a mega-scheme to expand agriculture westward, anchored by the future of Egypt, Mostakbal Miser Farms. On paper, it's a neat triangle. First, pull raw water from the Rosetta branch of the Nile. Second, capture the old delta's agricultural drainage, basically the leftovers after irrigation, and treat it at the massive El Hammam plant designed to process around 7.5 million cubic meters a day. Third, supplement with groundwater from underlying desert aquifers. Feed all of that into canals, pipelines, and a chain of pumping stations, and you've got a new breadbasket within trucking distance of Cairo's markets. Let's start with what's undeniably impressive. The El Hammam New Delta plant is an engineering flex. It's a record breaker in both size and throughput and it ties into a 120-kilometer conveyance that intercepts agricultural wastewater before it can stagnate or pollute coastal lagoons. Without this kind of recycling, Egypt would be in even tighter water straits. Officials say the country is already reusing tens of billions of cubic meters of drainage and treated wastewater each year. That isn't a nice-to-have. It's a survival strategy when your annual Nile allocation has been frozen for decades while your population surges. Layer on top, the plan to move roughly 10 million cubic meters a day into the new delta via new pumping works. And you can see how the pipes, canals, and stations form a circulatory system for a desert-grown food machine. If you just judge it by the satellite before and after, it looks like victory the grid of center pivots appearing in once blank desert, a pixelated green bloom. But water doesn't get from river to field by magic. It gets there with energy and a lot of friction. Mostakbal Misr alone has required new power stations and transformer yards because lifting water again and again across the desert's subtle staircase of ridges adds up fast. Each lift pushes millions of tons of water uphill every day. Multiply the head by the flow rate and you understand why the project's underbelly is electrical. In practice, this means either burning more gas or finding more renewables. Egypt has some of both. The Benban Solar Park was a global headline a few years back, and new deals keep getting signed for gigawatt-scale solar and wind. The dream is that arrays of photovoltaic panels can shoulder a chunk of the pumping and eventually feed desalination, too. The reality for now is that pumps don't pause just because a cloud passes or the afternoon dust kicks up. Grid stability and storage still matter, and the national grid has been under stress. If you're doing agriculture at this scale, you can't afford the water to be late. If you're enjoying the video so far, don't forget to hit that like button. It helps the channel a ton and tells the algorithm this kind of deep dive is worth showing to more people. Okay. So you've lifted the water and made a green circle on the sand. What happens beneath the crops is as important as what you see from the highway. Irrigation in arid zones is a salt management problem disguised as a water problem. Every liter you apply carries dissolved salts, and once the sun strips away the water, the salts stay. In humid climates, winter rain can flush them out. In deserts, that rinse cycle never comes. You have to design it. That means installing effective subsurface drainage and budgeting extra water for leaching, deliberately overwatering so salts are pushed below the root zone. If you don't, yields crash and soils are scarred for years. Egyptian agronomists know this. The Nile Delta itself has been the site of some of the world's largest tile drainage programs precisely to stop waterlogging and salinization. 
but the new delta is a different beast. Sandy, calcareous soils, hotter winds, and, crucially, a mixed diet of water sources where salinity may creep up, especially when you're recycling drainage or tapping brackish aquifers. Modern tools, drip irrigation, soil moisture sensors, satellite-guided scheduling, can squeeze the most crop per drop and keep salinity in check with surgical leaching. But that means money, training, and enforcement. If operators fall back to broad brush sprinkler sets and surface flooding because it's simpler or cheaper in the short run, the salt tab comes due. Then there's the groundwater. Under the Sahara lies one of the planet's great reservoirs, the Nubian sandstone aquifer system, along with younger formations nearer the Mediterranean margin. Some of this water is fossil, recharged thousands of years ago when the climate was wetter. It doesn't refill on human timescales. The track record here across the region is brutal. Saudi Arabia famously rode deep fossil aquifers to self-sufficiency in wheat in the 1980s and 90s. By the late 2000s, they were phasing the program out. And by 2016, essentially ending domestic wheat because the water math didn't pencil out. Libya built the great man-made river. Epic pipelines hauling sweet fossil water to the coast. It turned the desert green until maintenance, politics, and simple depletion realities caught up. Egypt's western aquifers aren't immune to the same physics. You can borrow from the geological past, but you can't borrow forever. The new delta's promise stands or falls on whether its designers treat groundwater as a strategic buffer and blend it carefully, rather than the easy lever to pull whenever a season runs tight. Cost sits behind all of this like a silent accountant. Lining canals, laying pipelines, building dozens of pumping stations, powering them, maintaining them in sand and heat, installing precision irrigation, training farmers, policing groundwater abstraction. None of this is one and done spending. It's a treadmill. That treadmill isn't just in dollars, it's in kilowatt hours and in institutional capacity. The optimistic view is that scale breeds efficiency. Big pumps are more efficient than lots of little diesel units. Solar and wind keep getting cheaper, and better sensors cut waste. The skeptical view is that mega projects get built to be opened, not maintained, and a decade from now, half the pumps are offline, drains are clogged with silt, and farmers are back to overwatering because it feels safer. Both futures are plausible. The difference between them is governance, metering, tariffs that reward efficiency, groundwater caps that actually bite, and agronomy support that's more than a ribbon-cutting speech. What about desalination? The tempting idea that the Mediterranean can be turned into a tap and piped inland. Egypt has been expanding desal, and on paper it's a great partner for agriculture because it's drought-proof. But desal water is expensive water. Reverse osmosis might sip as little as 3 kilowatt hours per cubic meter in the best cases, and more in real plants before you even account for pre-treatment and pumping inland. For a farm that needs thousands of cubic meters per hectare per season, the power bill gets eye-watering, fast. Brine disposal is the other headache. You can't just pump concentrated brine back into shallow coastal waters without consequences. DeSalle will likely play a supporting role drinking and industrial water for new desert towns, strategic top-ups for high-value crops, not the main course for millions of feddens of cereals. There's a more subtle constraint, too. Recycling agricultural drainage is both brilliant and self-limiting. The more efficient farmers become with modern irrigation, the less drainage there is available to recycle. Success upstream can starve your fancy new treatment plant downstream. Egypt's water strategists have flagged this paradox. Modernization and reuse must be co-planned, so that as canal losses and on-farm waste shrink, alternative sources ramp or the cropping pattern shifts toward less thirsty, higher-value plants. Otherwise, you build the world's biggest recycling factory and then struggle to feed it. If this all sounds like we're pouring cold water on the dream, it's because the failure modes in desert agriculture are sneakily predictable. First comes the triumphalist aerial tour. Look at all the circles. Then the energy bills bite, the salinity creeps, the groundwater tables drop, and the fragile profitability depends on cheap power and cheap water that don't stay cheap. The counterexample is Israel, which cracked much of this decades ago by going all in on drip, pricing water realistically, 
recycling wastewater obsessively, and matching crops to water quality. Even then, their version of greening the desert is more about precision than area. High-value crops on carefully managed land, not a continental push to relocate staple grains into the sand. So where does that leave Egypt's new delta? Not doomed, not guaranteed, conditional. The winds are real. Recycled water that would have been a pollutant becomes a resource. The logistics of feeding Cairo improve, and a chunk of strategic crops can be grown without more Nile withdrawals. But the project's sustainability depends on a discipline that mega visions often lack. Use the Nile and recycle drainage as the backbone and treat fossil groundwater like an emergency reserve. Hardwire precision irrigation, field by field, not as a brochure term, but as audited practice. Build and maintain deep subsurface drainage everywhere and plan for the leaching water it demands. No exceptions. Tie more of the pumping to dedicated solar and wind with storage where it pencils out. Not because it's trendy, but because it stabilizes long-term operating cost. And above all, measure and price water in a way that nudges every operator toward the efficient path, not the easy path. When people ask, can you really farm a desert without running out of water? The honest answer is yes, for a time and at a price. The sustainable version is slower, smarter, and smaller than the political slogans suggest. And it absolutely can't lean on aquifers like a bottomless battery. Egypt is throwing everything at the problem. Canals, treatment plants, pumps, pipelines, renewables, even dreams of new cities with yacht marinas tethered to artificial rivers. If those investments come with the boring, relentless work of salinity control, groundwater restraint and honest water accounting, the new delta could age into something durable. If they don't, we already know how this movie ends, because we've seen the reruns in Saudi wheat fields and Libyan oases. The green will last long enough for a few spectacular harvests and drone shots, and then the salt, the bills, and the physics will take over. The big question isn't whether Egypt can paint the desert green. It can. It's whether the system behind that green can be built to outlast the photo op. You'll find all the sources I used linked down below if you want to see the maps, numbers, and the engineering details yourself. And if this got you thinking about the energy side of water, especially how to power pump some treatment without burning more gas, you'll probably enjoy our last video on Copenhagen Atomic's tiny thorium molten salt reactors and whether breed-as-you-go heat boxes could be the industrial backbone for projects just like this.